Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday and happy hot Wednesday. I don't know what the temperature is like where you are, but here in Pennsylvania, it is a steamy 80, 85. I don't know. It feels like 100 to me in this Northeaster girl's blood. Um, so I am so excited to welcome you all into Talking Trees. This episode is in honor of Garden for Wildlife Month, which is the month of May. But I think our guest today celebrates Garden for Wildlife Month all year round. I'm really excited to welcome in my guest. Let's bring him in, Adam Baker from Akron, Ohio. Hey, Adam. Hello, how are you today? I am great, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. Thanks today, for having me. I am so excited. Um, I obviously love wildlife. I wear them on my clothes. <laughs> and you obviously do too. Tell us a little bit before we jump in, because I know everyone's going to be wondering, what is in the tank behind you? Uh, so in the tank behind me, we have a common snapping turtle. Looks like he is in the back. But also have a uh, an alligator snapping turtle over here to the right. And uh, it's been a while since I've had kept turtles, but I've uh, just gotten back into it. And <laughs> snapping turtles too are they're gonna get as big as the ones I've seen, like in uh, the ponds. Yeah, the, uh, the the common snapping turtle will max out probably 20 pounds or so, and then the uh, the alligator snapping turtle can get rather big and uh, will probably outlive me. So That is so neat. I've never really known someone to have snapping turtles as pets. I've heard of snapper soup. Shh, don't tell your turtles that. But um, I have never heard of them as pets. So um, Megan wants to know what their names are. So the common snapping turtle is Cousteau, and the alligator snapping turtle is Elric. He, okay, well, right now he has his mouth open and he's wiggling around his vermiform uh, lure on his tongue that looks like a little uh, worm, and uh, he will be sucking up the guppies probably while we're talking. So. so I saw the fish in there, so that is not a fish tank. That tank is strictly for turtles and the guppies are food. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a diet of fresh fish and uh, insects and uh, romaine lettuce and things like that. Wow, healthier than me. Um, well, we're not here to talk about turtles and snapping turtles. We're here to talk about trees for bees. You're following Davey on Facebook or you're finding you're coming across this because either you love trees or you love pollinators or you love both. Um, and that very well describes you, Adam. Um, you are the, a new technical advisor at the Davey Institute and you've done research on ecology and host plant interactions, interactions of monarch butterflies and other pollinators. You've been published in scientific journals, magazines, and you've won countless awards. Um, and some of the research you've done, we'll share a link to the research, really neat get graphics about trees for bees, specifically planting trees for bees that of course are helping our other pollinators too, right? It's not just, just for bees. It's um, some of them are, what are they called? Keystone species, not specific species species that will help bees and butterflies and moths right so bees are going to be the you know, the heavy lifters of the pollination world but there's all sorts of other uh creatures that are going to be uh oh he froze okay well while adam is unfreezing. I want to know, first of all, where you guys are from. Sage, you said it is warm in Kent. Show me your emojis and let me know where you guys are tuning in from and let me know um, how the weather is there. Give me a sun emoji. Give me the water droplet emoji because I'm sweating it here. Um, I am really excited to be able to sit outside today because Hopefully maybe a little bee or pollinator will even fly by, but because it's so beautiful, it's spring, we want to share this with you. And so let us know where you're tuning in from. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about Garden for Wildlife and why we're talking here about trees for bees anyway. The, the bottom line is 85% of the plants that are on this planet, specifically in North America, require a pollinator. Bees are pollinators. They take nectar from one plant or pollen from one plant, share it with another, and voila. In fact, one third of our fruits and vegetables are pollinated by bees. So if you like coffee, wine, beer, and lots of other foods, 
you can thank a bee. And so they're very important. But I think that oftentimes it is our um, po uh, perennial plants that get all of the credit when it comes to pollinator plants. And so when we invited Adam today, we asked him to pick five of his most favorite trees for bees, because that's what he did his research on. So we asked him to pick his most favorite trees for bees. And um, he has a great list that he's gonna share with us of what his favorites are. I know Eden saying, thank you bees. Obviously, we talk about this, this perennial plant being kind of the favorite, but still, even though these plants are put in some gardens, our pollinators are still fighting to, to survive. There are lots of big gaps in our backyards. We have lots of lawns where we have a little perennial garden. And so a tree, of course, is going to be larger and be able to amplify that pollen. Adam is back. Um, and so the more trees that you can plant that support bees, the better. Hi. Hello. <laughs> that's that's number one. But hey, we'll we'll get through it. You'll come back and you'll be here and I'll still be talking. That's the beauty of this. Um, we said all nice things about you. Sounds good. <laughs> so if I ask people to give us some emojis about the weather where they are. We've got sun. We've got fireworks. That must mean it's really hot. Um, and we did, Jen, later if... If Adam happens to drop off, drop off again, I'll give you the story on the shirt. But for now, let's hear from Adam. We, I gave a little background, Adam, on pollinators and why they're important. I did the whole, you know, bees eat, thir pollinate two thirds of the food that we eat. Without them, there would be no coffee, people. So, um, <laughs> but why don't you give us a little background on the state of pollinators and why it's important that we are thinking about trees for bees? I mean, so certainly, so, uh, you know, pollinators are one of the indicators for sort of the overall ecological health of any system. Um, and when they're active, uh, it's going to be, it's going to tell us that the, the system is working, the system is functioning, especially when we look at some of the pollinators that are specialists or some of the uh, parasitoids that also pollinate that are going to be after some of these specific pollinators. So, uh, the great thing about, you know, trees, if you think about a tree that's in fully in bloom, if you were to lay that canopy on the ground, it would look like a little meadow. You think mm. one plant is creating so much nectar and so much pollen, uh, which what was why trees uh, are such a great nectar and pollen source uh, for pollinators in general. Now, we are seeing decline of pollinators worldwide, and that is going to be for a number of reasons. It's because of uh, the way that we manage our So you said something so interesting. Oh, wait, Adam, I lost you. I can still hear you, but I lost your video. Huh. I think you might have to leave and come back or maybe refresh your page and you'll be there because we can't see you. Um, but I just loved what he just said about if you take the canopy of a tree and lay it out on the ground, um, it becomes a meadow because it is, that's absolutely beautiful to think about like the enormity of a tree and you're planting one tree and how many species that could help and save. So noted, Adam, when you, when we couldn't see you, that the guests couldn't hear you either. So if that happens again, you just come on back. All right, we'll do. Uh, so yeah, like I said, that's a, that's an interesting way to envision it. You know, just if you were to lay out every bloom on your tree on the ground, what that would actually look like and, you know, how much investment it takes to create a meadow versus planting one tree and the payoff you get for uh, that continued resource. This isn't going to be an annual flower that's going to have problems competing with invasive weeds or anything like that. This will be a tree that will be there for many years and continually provide those resources uh, for the bees. I love and when we're thinking idea. about like our trees, what, one thing you really want to accomplish with your landscape is to create sort of a buffet for pollinators from the early season to the late season so we can maintain uh, you know, that productivity and that function throughout the season, uh, where a lot of some of our 
our favorite ways to plant things is to plant things in clusters with the same thing over and over and over to get sort of that, I know, aesthetic appeal. But when we're thinking about the ecology and function of the landscape, maybe it's better to pick and choose things and block things out by the, by the time of year that they bloom. And so that'll add interest throughout the year as well as provide all that nectar and pollen that the, that the pollinators are going to need. So I've always wondered a question about that planting in three seasons for the nectar and really four seasons for berries if you're interested in birds. But um, is it different pollinator species that need the different food throughout those three seasons? Or is it the same pollinator species that, need, that are going to be in your garden from spring through fall? So yeah, we're going to see a different uh, community of pollinators throughout the year. Uh, for instance, we're outside in April uh, this year on one of those warm days that we had, and you saw a bunch of little things that looked like ant mounds with a bunch of little insects hovering over the ground. Those were these really early season, really cool bees called Andrenid bees. Uh, they're also known as the digger bees or the mason bees or, or the, uh, the mining bees, sorry. And uh, those guys are really early in the season. We get them somewhere around March or April. And then by about this time to mid-June, uh, they sort of disappear from our landscapes. And then we sort of transition into some of the more social bees, like the bumblebees right now are building up their communities. We'll see a lot more of those small metallic green sweat bees and, and other bees like that throughout the season. Uh, but sort of the ones that hang around the longest are gonna be the, the bumblebees and our, our, our course, our domestic honeybees. Those will go pretty much from the beginning to the end of the season. But throughout the season, certain species will fade in and fade out because mm -hmm. their life cycle only needs to last a, a month or so, where essentially these are gonna be a lot of these, what they call solitary bees that are not in these social, uh, uh, social hierarchies like some of our, our honeybees. And essentially what they do is uh, the, the females will go out, they'll go collect balls of pollen, which are a great protein source for their young, and they'll provision them into either their burrows or, or into cavities, depending on the type of bee, and they'll lay an egg on, upon those pollen balls, and then the larvae will uh, hatch out, begin to feed, it'll feed all the way through until it develops and pupates, and then usually that bee is going to be the one that emerges next spring. I love that. And one of the things when I just actually learned solitary bees are usually not dangerous and don't sting because the honeybee, which is more like a lives in a colony. So think of a solitary bee, the colony bee has something to protect, right? Adam, it's like their queen or maybe their babies, whereas a solitary bee is not going to be as aggressive because it doesn't have that thing to protect. So they usually don't sting. Well, sort of. That's sort of anthropo, you know, sort of humanizing it for us. But that's what I what like. What really is going on is that uh, in a social bee system, basically the thing that you get stung by is a modified ovipositor. And an ovipositor is a basically a tool that an insect uses to place its egg where it wants to place its egg, whether that be on a pollen ball, whether it be inside another insect, whether it be somewhere else. So you really only see stinging insects in the social. Uh, orders. It same goes for wasps too. There are tons and tons of solitary wasps, mm -hmm. but their ovipositors are still functioning to deposit eggs. Whereas in a beehive, you have thousands and thousands of workers that are not reproductive. So now those have evolved into stingers, and those are putting venom, uh, you know, into you as they sting you. Um, Interesting. So let's, when we're talking about trees for bees, the important thing is to know that we're not talking about necessarily attracting honeybees to your yard, the domesticated honeybee that might sting you. We're talking about attracting a lot of these pollinators that are generally not going to be harmful for, to you. And I really just want to bust some myths on, you know, being afraid of bees. So I'm really trying to teach my children that they see a bee and they're, ah, so, you know, I'm trying to teach you guys all that too. There is not a lot to be afraid of. Um, yeah, generally bees are not very aggressive at all, even the social bees. If you accidentally stumble into their nest and they feel like they're being invaded, they may sting you. But if they're out foraging and, and pollinating, they, they are not worried about you whatsoever. Uh, you can actually go up and pet bumblebees because they're soft and fuzzy and they will maybe stick their arm up and try to slap you away. But uh, they're pretty calm. Uh, 
usually bees get a bad rap because of one pest or which is the you know the eastern yellow jackets uh, those are the the ones that give all things with black and yellow stripes a bad name um, so yep. hopefully that's not a yellow jacket on your shirt or else no. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um, we got two questions. People are so excited and interested in bees. And so the first one is about this aggression, but are bees aggressive towards each other? Or is the aggression just an outward, you know, intruder, like human or Winnie the Pooh type thing? Uh, they are certainly territorial. Even, you know, both the solitary and the social bees are going to be territorial. You know, the you know, honeybees is our example. Uh, they actually put, you know, place guards at the at the entrance of their nests. Uh, wasps do very similar things too, where you see the paper wasps on those hanging nests, where you see their face markings. They can actually tell who's in their their nest by recognizing the facial markings of the other wasps. And if they see a wasp that they don't recognize, then they will attack it because it's probably there to to steal resources or food so interesting so yes courtney they do and jill i don't want to bust jill's bubble because i've heard about these bee houses uh, particularly for these solitary bees like the mason bee and then what's the other one that uses the bee house that the tubes lots of them do i know there's lots of species um so i've heard some conflicting evidence on these pollinator houses what is your take on whether putting these kinds of things in your yard will attract bees or help them with their babies um well i, I really love the idea of sort of naturally creating habitat and overwintering habitat for your bees um so you'd mentioned the ones with the little bamboo tubes those are going to be our mason bees and our leaf cutter bees and uh what I would do with that is if you have like a pollinator plant at your house, something with like a, a perennial plant with a hollow stem, what you can do is actually in the, you know, after you get as much winter interest out of it as you'd like, you can cut those and leave about 10 inches of that stem up there and it'll be hollow. And those will be great places for bees to nest in. Also things like having logs available uh, and having uh, areas with loose soil for all those mining bees to use are great ways to attract bees for habitat here at your place. Um, as far as the actual bee houses themselves, uh, there is some controversy out there about them. Um, so if you are interested in, in, in having one of those, I would do it for an educational uh, and for a sort of therapeutic and enjoyable aspect. I would maybe put one and then observe it and enjoy it. Don't put, you know, tons of them all over the house to save the bees, but instead create some of those natural habitats where they're going to be able to, to do their own thing. Uh, the problem is you kind of cluster all of them in one spot, which means if something comes along that can parasitize them or a fungus gets in there or something like that, then all of the bees that are utilizing that house are going to suffer from that. But if there's multiple areas spread out across the property, then uh, they'll have an opportunity to, to hang out in there and raise their young in there. You'll have to keep us updated, Jill, if you attract any of the solitary bees to your house and send us some pictures. Um, I had one too, and it no, nothing ever happened, but it was it was pretty, and they're really artistic and they're beautiful. So I think that's you know it's kind of like garden sculpture. Um, all right, we're still talking bees. One more question from Sage, and I'm afraid she has carpenter bees. Is your Sage is your patio wood? She's saying if I'm seeing bees on my patio, does that mean I have pollinators in my garden? So I think it's kind of hard for you adam to discern that but i don't know why my first instinct was pollinate was carpenter bees but what do you think uh so the question is if you're seeing them there is there pollinators in the landscape uh um certainly um of course you know carpenter bees can be destructive in certain cases um but they are also one of the hardiest and uh biggest and baddest pollinators out there they're Lots of lots of hairs that grab pollens. They're huge. Nice. They're active uh, for throughout most of the day and throughout most of the year. Um, so they're generally harmless. They're there to create holes in the wood to to raise their young. Um, so if you can have other spots on your property where you maybe leave some logs and things like that, they may be attracted more to that than your porch. But certainly those those carpenter bees are going to be good pollinators. And if they're there, they're certainly putting in work on the landscape. So. Yeah. And even I think the same goes to if they're not carpenter bees, because she said her porch is not wood. So, um, yeah, I mean, if she's seeing them on her patio, likely there's something in her garden that they enjoy. Right. They're not going to be there if the, there's no nectar or pollen for them. 
Yeah, and sometimes too, there'll be other bees like the the uh, cavity nesting bees. They'll see like the uh, you know a screw or something in your on your patio, and they'll actually come and investigate it because they think it's a cavity they can get into and nest in. And you know they'll be hovering around there. You know they they won't find what they're looking for, but they will show up and investigate for sure. Cool. So much excitement around bees. Um, so let's talk trees and the bees they support. So I was so glad when you sent me your list that I have right behind me. Which one do you want to start with? Do you want to start with the red bud? Yeah, that'd be a good one. Kind of ordered them through succession of blooms. So awesome. I have um, a picture of, of course, the spring blooming because even though they're beautiful now, mine is a dark red leaf. Um, this is the spring blooming red bud. So tell us about why this is so great. Yeah, so this is this is a, a great tree because it blooms in that early season and sort of its habit makes it a great choice for putting it in areas where you may have, you know, uh, power lines overhead. You may have restrictions in height. It's It's sort of this edge of the forest uh, tree, you'll see it, you know, if you're driving through the mountains uh, in the spring, you'll see these just profuse blooms everywhere. And this one is really great because at this point in the year, there's not a lot of, you know, nectar and pollen sources available. Um, so something like a red bud, you can see, I mean, if you had to guess how many blooms were on that single picture, I would say it is in the thousands. And this is going to be a really important uh, tree for things like those mining bees we had mentioned before. Um, they are going to use this uh, quite readily and this is going to be a great tree for them. And it's also great to add in if you're trying to create that season long landscape. This is a perfect option for that early season bloomer for you. I love this suggestion. Um, and I think people are also like they know some of their big oaks they can plant, but the understory tree I think is not a well utilized tree. So it makes a great layered tree as well awesome what should we do next uh we can go on to the the crab apple certainly um so where the the eastern red bud we had just mentioned has a very particular flower form which makes it so only certain types of insects can use it uh but the crab apple on the other on the other hand is this very open flower form you think it's almost got like that plate like old world rose sort of look mm. so basically what that enables is pretty much any bee of any shape or size can get into that flower. They can utilize it. Once again, uh, if you had to guess how many flowers are on the, the crab apple in this picture, it's going to be quite a big resource. If we envision that laid out on your property, it was going to take quite a bit of space. Um, so this is going to be just a great one to sort of kickstart uh, the, the pollinator populations. And it's going to be a flower that can be utilized by pretty much uh, any bee. And once again, it fits in sort of that, uh, you know, short uh, understory type category where you can sort of use it in places that you can't necessarily use a big, you know, large tree. I think that's a great tip. So um, I also want to note when Adam's giving you these trees, he is giving you multiple bloom times like we talked about before that it's important to have three seasons of bloom and so if you're taking notes and you're saying i want to add these trees to my landscape add them all i'll tell you from personal um experience i have flowering cherry which is right behind me that'll bloom first then my crab well then my red bud i guess right then my crab apple in the spring i have full month of blooming interest. So it's not just great for the bees, you guys. It is great for your gardens and your interests too. So you want to have multiple, multiple trees. Don't just pick one of these. Pick, pick a couple. Yeah, we had sort of approached this question uh, when I was working as a lab technician uh, in uh, a lab at UK. And the question was, can we create a list of be attractive trees that's that's has it was you know, based on science there's tons and tons of lists everywhere out there most of them you know anecdotal mm. lists based on people's own observations from their own properties so what i was tasked with when i was in that lab was to find be attractive trees find five locations uh that are separate from one another and go and sample all of those trees for the types of bees so we could look at the communities as well as rate the attractiveness. So I did offer, I did put that link in there as well. So if you want to take a look at that, um, those are all based on actual observations and collections of bees that we did on about 75 different species 
in the Ohio River Valley region. So nice. take a look at that. And uh, that's mostly where I'm pulling some of my favorites from uh, on this list. So. Okay, great. Courtney, I think I sent you that link if you would post that, please. Okay, who's next? Uh, so next we have the Bottle Brush Buckeye. Okay, so um, this is a bigger picture. So I'm going to hide myself for a minute if you just talk through this Bottle Brush Buckeye, and that way the picture will be bigger, and I'll be back. Certainly. So uh, the Bottle Brush Buckeye, um, this is going to be more of a sprawling shrub type of uh, buckeye. And uh, basically, I like this one a lot because it's got these great panicle type flowers on the top. It's very showy. And it's the way that the flowers are laid out, they almost have, oh, I gotta go this way. They almost have this sort of shape, right? So it's kind of like this big tongue coming off there, which makes it very easy for a bunch of different types of pollinators to get in there and access that nectar. Uh, not only is this one great for bees, but also it attracts a lot of butterflies. There was one planting I went and looked at at the Cincinnati, uh, one of the uh, cemeteries in, the, in Cincinnati. And uh, this thing was just covered in swallowtails uh, and all sorts of other butterflies. Uh, hummingbirds were visiting this one as well. Um, as far as some other some other buckeyes out there, uh, also I really like the the red horse chestnut buckeye. That's going to be a much bigger tree if you're looking for something bigger. And that one is just going to be very very good for bumblebees and honeybees. So if you're looking to support those larger uh, type bees, that's going to be an awesome option for you as well. Cool. I was up, um, we go to Martha's Vineyard every summer, and I always love to go to the Poly Hill Arboretum. I don't know if you've ever visited that on Martha's Vineyard. And I, that was the first time I ever saw that bottle brush tree, and I took pictures of it because it was covered in different types of butterflies and bees and living creatures. And I said, I want that plant in my house and I forgot about it until you sent me this list and I thought oh I need to add it because those flowers are the coolest looking flowers do you know if you can cut them I know this is not a cut flower conversation but do they look good inside I, I wouldn't no. think so they're they're pretty uh wimpy as far as that is concerned I would imagine uh but also the foliage too I mean you really don't get to enjoy buckeye foliage that much because you know it's usually over our heads yeah whereas like you know the sprawling form of the bottle brush buckeye it's really neat it's got that you know star shaped sort of leaf going on it almost has like a little bit of like a tropical plant sort of feel even though it's a nice native shrub for us yeah I mean I think I even grabbed a close-up here how cool is that and now you know the name bottle brush you can't forget that because it's very obvious whoever named that thank you <laughs> All right, you want to keep going? Yeah, so the next one on my list is is the winged sumac. And this one, uh, it's not going to be appropriate for every single landscape, but in a place where you want to sort of fill in some areas, it will sort of spread and, 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 and get some of the rhizomes in there. Um, so it'll, it'll be a little bit... Uh, I know, bullish in that in that sense, but as far as for the pollinators are concerned, it is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, this so when we went out to observe all of these plants, what we did is we'd have several different observers on each side of the plant. We would start a stopwatch for sixty seconds and count as many bees as we possibly could in sixty seconds. This particular plant, uh, we maxed out the entire potential of how many bees we would count in that 60 seconds, you know, somewhere reaching around, you know, 80 or so, which is about the max you can possibly count and identify in that amount of time. Um, when we came up to this plant initially, uh, we were scouting our, our local arboretum and we could actually, it sounded like there was a train coming around the corner because there's so many bees just buzzing on these flowers. Uh, the honeybees were crazy for it. The bumblebees were crazy for it. It also had a lot of different diversity of different types of bees. Uh, this one is going to bloom right in the heat of summer in July or so. It's got a beautiful leaf. It's got those winged leaves. And then the, uh, the fruits on it as well are, are quite tasty. You can use them to make uh, teas and things like that as well. But if you do have a lacquer allergy, you probably want to stay away from that because they are in the same family. But yeah, so this was a cool. 
That is a new one to me. Um, I don't know if you guys, I know Sylvie was saying she first saw the bottle brush in California. Um, but so a question about these trees that you're telling us, are they mostly Eastern? So I know it was the Eastern red bud or are these trees that will work for most zones in the country? You know, like a five, four to four to eight, five to eight. Um, so these are, are, are all Eastern species, except for the last one we're going to be talking about. Um, I haven't spent tons of time on the West Coast, so I'm not really sure how well they transfer, but know. Uh, you know, you want to stay somewhat in the same sort of zones. And if, and uh, you know, nine times out of 10, there's usually a Western variety in the things we're talking about. Um, so find something of similar uh, form that's going to sit, fit the same function and something that's going to bloom for you as well, so. Okay, cool, good tip. All right, let's do the last one. Is this it? Yeah, so the last. Yeah. The last one we're talking about is the seven suns flower. So uh, there is a lot of uh, talk out there about you know the native only approach, and that's that's good for for reasons of that it supports native caterpillars, which then support you know native birds. It supports native animals, but as far as flowers and nectar and pollen are concerned, uh, we can dabble in just a little bit of non-native, non-invasive plants. And the one that I'm thinking about is the seven suns flower. Now I had one of these blooming right outside my office uh, when I discovered it uh, while I was at the university. And this guy is gonna be a, a tree from Southeast Asia. It's gonna be a non-native, non-invasive tree that blooms in a time where there's very little blooming, at least in that Ohio Valley River region. So this is gonna bloom uh, into fall, into September. Uh, this is gonna be a great plant for supporting a bunch of those bees still hanging on in the late season, as well as supporting uh, migrating monarch butterflies uh, in that very late season when it's crucial for uh, nectar uh, sources to be available to help sustain their flight. Um, so, this is just one example of if you're creating a landscape that you want to have that season long bloom period, uh, use mostly natives. But if you can dabble in a non-native that blooms at a time where there's not a whole lot going on in the landscape, that can be very beneficial to our pollinators and helping them sustain you know, throughout that season long resources. Uh, amazing. I love that list. That is so wonderful. And you teed us right up to talk about because I think a lot of times people talk about natives, 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 um, and access to natives can sometimes be an issue. Where do you get them? Uh, so I appreciate you giving us an option that's not necessarily a native, but not invasive. So I want to pivot a little bit unless you guys want to interrupt me and ask about some specific trees because we're here to help you guys. We want you guys to get your questions answered about what are the best trees for pollen. So we want to we want to help you out. But Adam, there are so much out there that we shouldn't plant or is not the right tree, right? So you gave us that seven suns, which is not necessarily an invasive. Just because it's not native doesn't mean it's invasive, right? Correct. It's definitely a difference there. Uh, basically, the invasive ones are the ones that have no checks and balances anymore. There's nothing controlling their populations, which allows them to help compete in native species that have to deal with all of those hardships like insects and fungus and you know viruses and things like that. Yeah. Uh, whereas some other trees can survive in our landscapes like the golden rain tree or I mean the uh, the seven suns flower tree that we're talking about is one of those ones that it's not going to be in its optimal growing habitat um, so it's not going to be spreading out all that much. It's, it's surviving, it's sustaining, but it's not in a point where it's going to get permission moving out uh, of our landscape. Got it. So you mentioned the golden rain tree. I'm going to pop that up here so you can tell us that's a no-no. So the golden rain tree, although it is highly attractive to bees, uh, it supports a large diversity of bees, um, it's not necessarily one that we want to be planted. So sort of my rule of thumb is if there's a common ornamental tree in your landscape, when you get on the highway, if you see it blooming for miles on, on every place that no one has planted it, it's probably not a good choice. 
And if you've ever driven up 75 from Lexington, you know, up through Ohio, you'll see the golden rain tree uh, blooming profusely. And at that point, those are the kind of trees that we don't want to be adding into our landscape because they have the potential to be invasive. Now these invasives become a problem because once again, you know, there's no checks and balances for the invasives. They can move out, uh, they can grow without having any difficulty and without having to overcome any hardships. And so basically when you see a scene like that, when you're driving up 75, there's golden rain trees on both sides. Now you have one species filling a niche where maybe a dozen species would have before. Uh, so it greatly reduces the biodiversity of the plants. And uh, it's also gonna have uh, effects on the invertebrates, the birds and everything else that are going to be affected by it. Yeah, so um, that, I'll tell a story about that. Another example, yeah. pear, I know that one just became on some of the invasive lists. In some of the spots uh, in Lexington, we see this terrible combo of bush honeysuckle and winter creeper, where essentially you'll have the legacy trees, black walnuts and black cherries and things like that. And then there's just this complete mid-story completely occupied by the honeysuckle and then the ground is completely occupied by winter creeper and when you start digging through the soil and looking through there there's just absolutely nothing going on because uh, only very generalist animals can survive in that sort of environment so that is so important that what adam just identified for you is that these invasive species will choke out all the other species so remember we've talked about the importance of three seasons of nectar and then all the other animals that these support birds eat these bugs so it also supports these bugs and then bigger birds eat those birds and it's just the entire ecosystem that's being affected by now only having one invasive species that blooms one time of year so that becomes i don't want to say an eco's dead zone i don't want to be dramatic but it becomes an eco dead zone own. Um, so invasive species are bad for so many reasons, but I really, I think that's so important what you said about that. Uh, I have a Bradford, or I have a Leland pear. Um, so I think if you have these trees, Adam, are we saying just chop them down or the suggestions are do not plant them anymore. Don't plant the golden rain tree. Don't plant the Bradford, any type of pear, ornamental pears. Um, but if we have them, is the advice to just cut them down? What is your advice? Uh, certainly don't be planting these things. Um, that's up to you whether what how you want to change and modify your landscape. But certainly if you have, you know, something that's invasive that you're spending money on to treat and maintain and things like that, uh, you know, Bradford pear, the one example they always use is it's got a very soft wood, so it continually breaks over and over and over. So you'll be cleaning up after that and dealing with that. Um, so just be vigilant when your landscapes, if you see these things moving out, just make sure that you're, you're, you're handling those new spreading ones out. And if you have the opportunity and time um, with your uh, reduced schedules from COVID and you want to get out in the yard and, and replace some trees with some awesome, some awesome natives that are going to play the same role for you, then, then that'd be great. Uh, if not, just be vigilant and, uh, you know, help, uh, the trees to make sure they're not getting and escaping from your lens. Yes. So um, I, my local arborist Wilma, in Wilmington here, Jason Gaskill said, don't worry about having it now. I wouldn't cut it down. He said, let's plant an oak right next to it. So as my oak gets older, the, like you said, the pear is going to be so weak. It does, they don't live very long anyway. So as it fails or it can be cut back as the oak grows. So I thought that was a great tip. You, a lot of us are, have inherited landscapes that aren't necessarily what we would have chosen, but over time you can make it your own to be beautiful for you, but also beautiful for the ecosystem around you. So you mentioned one more, the linden tree, which I thought was really interesting. So talk to us about the linden and why that's not one of your favorite trees for bees. So the linden tree, uh, it is one of the absolute best attractive uh, plants for pollinators, but it may not be the best choice for your landscape because it's also one of the most attractive meals for things like Japanese beetles. Um, so uh, part of why this whole controversy about pesticides ever came to light was because someone treated a linden tree in full bloom in a target parking lot on the west coast and dropped thousands and thousands of bees. 
So lindens are an example of a native plant that have a lot of herbivores that like to feed on them, which means there's generally gonna be some sort of management for this plant. Um, if you have a large Japanese beetle population in your area, uh, this tree will get defoliated from head to toe almost every year. And of course, that's not gonna be good for any tree. It can only uh, tolerate that a few times without any sort of management. So like I said, you know, this one especially, if you see a full-size linden in bloom, you'll, you'll look at it, you'll, it'll almost look like a mirage because there'll be so many bees flying around. If you envision all the flowers on the ground, it would make a very big meadow. But if there's a potential that you're going to have to treat the tree with an insecticide to maintain its health, uh, then you're putting pollinators at risk. So we want to avoid that risk whenever possible so maybe plant things that are going to be a little bit less attractive, but also have a lot less herbivores that are going to be fitting on them and will not need any sort of insecticidal management uh, whatsoever. I thought that was such an important tip. Um, and it, it also tees us right up nicely for my next question, which is uh, about these trees specifically for bees. When we know we're planting for pollinators uh, and we're choosing the right tree for the right spot, we're choosing trees not like lindens that don't really necessarily need management if they're healthy. Is there a right care um, plan for them? You know, not spraying, regularly fertilizing, organic fertilizer, what pruning, what is the right care plan for our specific trees for bees? Uh, well, you, pre you always uh, want to avoid any sort of management whenever the trees are in bloom or when the blooms are coming on. So generally, the best time to treat a tree that needs management is directly after the blooms fall off for the year. If you have to make a quick pivot adjustment to, to treat a tree because it's in dire health, you can always do something like put a net around the tree to exclude the pollinators, trim off the flowers, but generally, nothing's going to be that imperative. You can usually just wait until after it's done blooming. Or, you know, choose trees that you aren't going to have tons and tons of pests. Um, don't plant things that are highly attractive to brown marmorate stink bugs and Japanese beetles and everything else that's going to cause problems for your trees. Um, and then a lot of these trees aren't going to need to be treated because they are going to be uh, native trees that are going to be filling small gaps. And as long as you don't have a huge concentration of the same species, you're probably not going to have a huge concentration of the same herbivore that's going to be attractive to your plants. Awesome. I love that. I have also heard that, um, tr is it true if you do spray at night that the pollinators will be less likely to be out? Is that not true? Yeah, the pollinators are generally active from about 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, so if you are going to be treating something, uh, you can do it at night. Uh, but once again, if it's flowering, you don't want to be treating it at all. So that, that window is probably not going to be important for you. But if you are spraying something, there is the potential for drift. So if you have the choice and you can do something like a systemic insecticide treatment, or something that's going to reduce risk, like a selective uh, insecticide treatment. For instance, there's like the, the, the classic example is the BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a bacterial insecticide that only affects caterpillars because it's specific to their, their biology and will only affect them. So if you treated an entire you know, plant in bloom with a BT, it's not going to be affecting the bees. Um, once again, you don't want to do that when it's in bloom, but uh, just as an example, that's going to be a selective pesticide. Mm -hmm. And also, you can make decisions based on how the tree itself uh, completes its reproductive cycle. So, for instance, we have problems with the emerald ash borer. So the ash tree uh, does not create nectar. It is mainly wind pollinated. So that is an example of a tree that you can treat with a systemic insecticide, because if you don't, you're gonna lose it to the ash borer. And really the potential for pollinator risk is gonna be pretty low. Pollinators do visit it and utilize the pollen, but it's not gonna be a highly attractive tree. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other great benefits to that tree to save and protect your tree. And you can save and protect them. You mentioned stink bugs. Um, do you have a solution for my dog? He likes to eat stink bugs. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. 
My dog likes to eat stink bugs. <laughs> Don't know what so the problem is. Does he, does he is have there. like that banana banana smell breath then? Or <laughs> banana? It smells like like rotten cilantro. I think. You think it smells like bananas? It smells like bananas to me. I don't that know. That might be like a genetic thing. Um, you know, like cilantro, people who like cilantro or don't. Um, yeah, maybe you just need to, you know, feed them more. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, there is so many great tips. We had some really great questions. You guys are really excited about bees. We could tell about the engagement and the questions you guys had early on. And I hope you were taking notes, but don't worry if you weren't. You can always rewind and watch this again. And we urge you to plant these trees. Now, I know it's getting a little hot. I know spring is a great time to plant trees. Would you suggest people can plant these trees right now or would they wait till fall? Um, generally, you'll have better success uh, in the fall or early spring when they're dormant, but uh, depends on what it is. Some trees you can uh, just cut a piece off and plant in your backyard. It's good to go. Others are a little bit more temperamental. So uh, check with your local arborist on which specific one you're looking at and when the, the optimal time to plant in your region is. That's a great tip. Yep. Contact your local arborist. I know we've posted a link there where you can find your local arborist or call them up and say, I want some trees for pollinators in my backyard. Adam Baker told me I need them. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Tell Cousteau, and I don't remember, it was the other name, a famous explorer as well. I wasn't familiar with that name. Uh, his, his name is Elric. He is, uh, he's not a famous explorer, but, uh, I can pull them out here though real quick. Will you touch them? Oh yeah. They don't bite you? And they try sometimes, but you know, Is eventually it I'll have a nice, you know, Christmas card with me holding a 50 that, pound snapping turtle here. But you can see That's the goal. That's Elric. That's Elric, yeah. And his mouth will open up about that much and he'll just sit there and wave his lure around. He's uh He's a sit and wait predator, whereas Cousteau is more like a monitor lizard with a shell on it. He's constantly moving and constantly getting into trouble. Wow, I love it. Um, Megan, I can tell you're an animal lover. Megan was the one who wanted to know their names earlier. So um, thank you. This has been great. You've shared so much great information with us about bees, about trees, and about snapping turtles. So we appreciate it. <laughs> so we And will... snapping turtles are not pollinators, just to clarify that. No, they are not. <laughs> Certainly be a... interesting if they were, though. <laughs> that would be. We're getting a lot of wows and woes on that snapping turtle. So maybe there's a whole nother topic we'll have you back for about reptiles and amphibians great well thank you so much for having me uh please check out that list i said we put tons and tons of work in it about three years of work look uh, looking at all those species and then keep in mind also uh they not may not be necessarily representative to your area or your specific location because those those communities of bees are different in different areas so uh you know keep an eye out be vigilant if you want great ideas for pollinator attractive plants, go to your local arboretum, go to your local parks. If you see you see the, the plants getting carried away by tons of thousands of little insects, you know that's a good one for you. And you might want to look at putting one in your landscape. So great tip. Visit your local arboretums and your botanical gardens. I love that. Thank you so much, Adam. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great day. Bye. But don't go away just yet. Um, I will be back next Wednesday. If you like this conversation next Wednesday, we will be talking trees again. We're here every Wednesday uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern. I'll have Chrissy Balk on and we're going to be talking about the benefits of trees. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we want to make sure you know not only are trees beneficial to our pollinators, they're also great for us too. So please come back May 26th at 3 p.m. Eastern right here on Facebook page, uh, Davies Facebook page. And for more information about trees, of course, you can check out Davies podcast. They have a podcast. It is so good. Also called Talking Trees, available on all regular podcast apps. So please keep hugging those trees. Show us what you've planted. And we'd love to engage with you more on our Facebook page. So. Let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye.